Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. My name is Rachel Pinotti. I'm the Director of Education and Research Services for the Levy Library here at Mount Sinai. It's my pleasure to welcome you this afternoon to the latest installation of the Levy Library's Research Insider series, Free or Fee, How Open Access Publishing Impacts Your Choices as an Author. Before we begin, a few brief house housekeeping notes for this afternoon. All participants are muted, and that's an effort to minimize background noise. That said, we do welcome your questions via the Q&A box, which should appear either at the bottom or right-hand side of your Zoom screen. We will be collecting the questions that you ask throughout this afternoon's session and posing as many as possible to the panel during the Q&A discussion at the end of today's program. If you encounter any technical issues, please send us a message via the Q&A box and our AV team will try to assist you. Before I turn it over to our wonderful speakers, I want to lay a foundation for this afternoon's seminar by addressing three key questions. Number one, what exactly is it that the open access publishing model is challenging? What is it that the OA model and the OA movement are seeking to change or replace? Two, why is this happening? And three, um, once we've gotten some clarity on the answers to these earlier two questions, that will prepare us to understand the answer to the third question, which is what is open access publishing? So starting out and just talking a little bit about what is the open access model challenging? Open access has become a disruptive force in the scholarly publishing industry over the last 20 years. But what exactly is it seeking to disrupt? Like any agent of change, it's seeking to replace the traditional model, which in the case of scholarly publishing is a subscription-based for-profit model in which the reader, or more commonly the library on behalf of the reader, pays to access content. This modern incarnation of subscription-based scholarly publishing in which the journals are published primarily by publishing companies rather than scholarly societies has been in place since about the 1950s. So why change? What about the existing model has prompted this change movement? Essentially, there's a recognition by a growing number of scientists, academics, librarians, and funders that there are some problems with the traditional model. There's a growing consensus that the traditional publishing model exploits the academic labor market and causes a misuse of public funds. So to speak to these two points, I'd like to share a quote from a 2017 article in The Guardian. Author Stephen Boranyi writes, scientists create work largely under their own direction, funded largely by governments, and give it to publishers for free. The publisher pays scientific editors who judge whether the work is worth publishing and check its grammar. But the bulk of the editorial burden, checking the scientific validity evalu and evaluating the experiments, a process known as peer review, is done by working scientists on a volunteer basis. The publishers then sell the product back to government-funded institutional and university libraries to be read by scientists who, in a collective sense, created the product in the first place. So I certainly thank the author of that article for concisely articulating these points. A third point that I think really does um, bear a mention in this context is that the traditional publishing model uh, precipitated the so-called serials crisis in libraries in which subscription costs consistently outpace growth in library budgets and consistently outpace objective measures such as the consumer price index all of which has led to an, uns an unsustainable situation for many libraries. With that foundation in mind, we can now turn to understanding the basic mechanics of open access publishing. It's a publishing model in which content is freely accessible to all with no subscription required. To cover editorial production and other costs, open access journals charge article processing charges. These are fees paid by authors. So essentially, when looking at the difference between the traditional model and the open access model, the major shift is from a reader pays model to an author pays model. Importantly, and I think this point is often overlooked, when publishing in a fully open access journal, 
the author retains copyright of their work, which is not traditionally true when, which is not true when, um, when publishing in a traditional subscription-based journal. So that's some sort of OA, um, OA model basics for all of us to lay the foundation. I hope that the presentation, my short presentation has served as a helpful broad strokes introduction to open access publishing. In today's seminar, we will be exploring and diving deeper into these important issues. We have a truly fantastic lineup of speakers to help us advance this conversation. I am thrilled that they've agreed to be with us this afternoon, and I'm excited to hear what they have to say. So with that, I'm going to introduce our first speaker. Um, we have Ms. Ashley Farley, who is the program manager in the Office of Knowledge and Research Services at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Over the past decade, Ms. Farley has worked in both academic and public libraries, focusing on digital inclusion and facilitating access to scholarly content. She completed her master's in library and information science through the University of Washington's Information School. In her role with the Gates Foundation, Ashley focuses on the foundation's open access policy implementation and associated initiatives. This includes leading the work of Gates Open Research, a transparent and revolutionary publishing platform. Other core activities involve supporting the strategic and operational aspects of the foundation's library. This work has sparked a passion for open access and a belief that freely accessible knowledge has the power to improve and save lives. Ashley, a warm welcome to you and thank you for joining us today. Great, thank you so much. I appreciate the introduction. Let me share my slides and we will get started. All right, thank you everyone for dialing on in and taking the time to discuss this with us today. I wanted to start with a short uh, disclaimer. So as mentioned, I am a, a librarian by my career. And so that's often the lens that I take uh, when talking about uh, publishing and open access. Um, I do now uh, through the foundation work with a lot of researchers, but uh, still come from kind of that librarian lens of wanting to connect people uh, with information. I also wanted to acknowledge that I, I work in a privileged institution. So I saw a uh, comment already about uh, open access models not only having to equate with APCs and wanted to highlight that, but also understanding that the work that I've done at the foundation, you know, we have had the privilege to pay a lot for open access and that has shaped our thinking and work as well, but also uh, recognizing our privilege there. And then much of what follows uh, is uh, generalization. So I like to, you know, say like hashtag not all publishers, so maybe it should be hashtag not all business models. Uh, that there are very many nuances in the ecosystem. And you know, when I'm, I'm critical about current models or future models, I'm not meaning to minimize anyone's work, but I do think having tough and critical conversations will help us make the ecosystem stronger. So to briefly cover kind of the foundation's open access journey. So we started our first policy back in 2015 and it's been an all grant agreement since then. Uh, in 2016, we launched Gates Open Research, which is one of my favorite projects to work on, and I think it's uh, uh, very indicative of leveraging technology to um, really free knowledge, and it's a fully open post-publication peer-reviewed kind of platform system with full versioning, which I think uh, is, is the way forward to, to correct a lot of many of the issues within uh, current uh, academic publishing, which hasn't quite moved on far from the print model that started it. Uh, this number is a little outdated now, uh, but we're about, I think, 24 million in open access fees spent for about uh, so roughly around eight 8,000 articles. When we think about that kind of money, I'm sure many could argue that um, it could be put elsewhere or it has a good impact for, for open access, but it's definitely something that we consider when looking at how we shape our policy is how much uh, we spend on those open access fees and how we best support or can better support the community through that funding. And then our policy in the beginning was very much a, I guess was a kind of a gold, like if there's an open access option, we would pay for it. We saw like little but promising movement in some of the publishers kind of changing their policies to then become compliant options for our grantees. Uh, but sadly, sometimes that those changes also then came with the highest open access fees. So when it was brought to our attention that there was a coalition of funders uh, with a set of principles created in 2018 known as Coalition S and Plan S, 
uh, it was already very well aligned with our goals and values around open access as well as our current uh, policy overall. So it, it made sense for us to join a larger funder community um, and, and we set upon the journey to change, make those changes to become Plan S compliant, which I definitely recognize was not a, a great time to change policy during a pandemic. Uh, but I think we've learned a lot from the pandemic around openness and collaboration and sharing that it actually strengthened uh, the reason why we're, we're doing this and, and really motivated us to get the policy in place. I wanted to show a quick snapshot, uh, but all of this is available on the Coalition S site as well. Um, so a lot of uh, definitely uh, Europe-centric national funders, but now also growing to include more uh, charitable and international funders. We're definitely always uh, looking to grow. We would like to be truly global. And it's been, at least for me, a very good a learning experience of how uh, other countries approach um, policies and how they fund science and also their uh, practices around publishing. So I definitely want to, you know, acknowledge that uh, right now it is it is very Western centric, but we are uh, working on on partnerships uh, globally as well. So what are the principles? So Plan S is, uh, has a set of I think ten principles, but this is kind of um, grouping them together. So of course for open access the publication should not be locked behind a paywall. And that's kind of our, our first uh, a tenant there. And then that that open access must be immediate, so no embargo periods. And I think this is uh, especially important during a, a pandemic, um, but there are also many other pressing challenges that we face in the world that immediate sharing of information is very important. And I think also from an equity standpoint, you know, we don't want to create a system where those that have immediate information are the ones that can afford it, and then those that uh, are not able to have to, to wait, and thus being kind of closed out of the, the research ecosystem there. Uh, so we want it to be immediate. Something that I've been really working with our grantee authors on understanding is a no copyright transfer. We really want authors to retain their copyright, and I'll definitely go into detail about the rights retention strategy a little bit later, but it's uh, it's interesting to to work with authors and see that there's there's just um, there's been you know such a a practice of signing over copyright with I think with I think without uh, fully thinking through the implications and what's that mean? It's similar to you know we download an app and there's terms and conditions and we just all right whatever accept. Um, it can be very similar in academic publishing as well. So we're spending time educating our grantee authors and why it's important to retain copyright. We're working on transparency around pricing and contracts. And when we talk about, you know, $24 million spend and open access publishing fees, um, you know, we, we really want to get to what we would consider a more reasonable level. And there's been a lot of discussion around uh, how do you define that? What does that mean? We definitely acknowledge that it does cost, of course, to be a publisher, to run a journal. Um, but when we see the, you know, high APCs for open access due to maybe rejections of like 92% of submissions, does, does that serve research uh, well? And I think there's a lot of uh, fun discussion to be had there. Multiple routes to compliance. So this is definitely very important to plan us. So uh, while we are trying to align all funders on, on policy and have that kind of collective active action position, it is definitely um, we wanted to be flexible in the routes because, again, not everyone can pay for all APCs or or have uh, grant budgets go towards those things. And so we wanted to ensure that uh, finding a, a comfortable route to open access compliance wasn't an issue. Um, and then uh, we're having more and more discussions both within the coalition and within the foundation to uh, assess research outputs based on their intrinsic merit and not necessarily the, the venue of publication. So what changed for the foundation more specifically were two pieces. So one is definitely um, what we pay for. So we're no longer paying for hybrid publications. Uh, the coalition and the foundation, we kind of co-wrote a whole piece that's on the uh, the coalition's website if you're interested in kind of delving into the topic, which would be a whole seminar itself around hybrid uh, publishing. But, you know, that was created really as a, a mechanism to try and, and uh, I think some of the terminology is forced to flip to full open access, and we haven't seen that 
in 30 years. Um, there's also often the most expensive type of open access publishing and also the least reliable and experienced for both uh, readers and, and uh, authors. Um, and then we, we have uh, added the green or self-archiving or what is called the rights retention strategy route as well. Lots of different terminology uh, floating around there. So I'm trying to define it all, but essentially there's the kind of archiving or sharing of a different version of the manuscript. So before we've always had a very much a staunch, like we pay for the final version of record to be open access. And we have now changed our, our position on that. And I think a lot of that is due to uh, the rise in, in, in APC costs, uh, the rise in uh, great tools to be able to surface other um, artifacts in repositories that discoverability and access has really improved for the green strategy. Um, so I'm excited that, that we've, we've adopted a couple other routes. And in general, so I wanted to also, so that was more from the foundation perspective, and this is the larger coalition uh, adding in kind of the uh, transformative arrangements. Again, that can be a whole topic in of itself uh, from a private foundation in the US. We haven't quite um, had the opportunity to try to negotiate any of those deals. It's, it's interesting to see how, you know, globally the kind of transformative arrangements work differently depending on what kind of funder you are and what institutions you fund. Uh, but just wanted to highlight that that is something that uh, other funders in the coalition are participating in. Uh, basically, you know, we're trying to offer as many different routes to, to publishers and authors, but again, the core of open access is always what we're, we're focused on. Okay, so on to one of my favorite topics is the rights retention strategy. This can definitely be a bit con confusing, it's very new, uh, but I think it's a, an exciting way to really uh, push for open access and, and show, especially from, from a funder perspective, that we are really serious about uh, rights retention and, and having authors see that as a way to further their impact and to ensure that what we're funding then uh, has an impact and is available uh, for easy reuse without any barrier. So we actually changed our grant agreement uh, to be compliant with Plan S to state that when you sign as a researcher your grant agreement, you're retaining sufficient copyright to make a version of your manuscript open access to wherever you may end up submitting it at the end of that grant. Uh, so there's a kind of special language that we, we share with our grantees to include the acknowledgement sections that is a reminder that, hey, we have a prior agreement that if this is to be accepted, the author accepted manuscripts. So the manuscript uh, after uh, it's gone through peer review and the author says, all right, it is, it is good to be shared with the world. Um, that can be immediately deposited in an open access repository, no embargo, and a CC by license. And then at that stage, the idea uh, is essentially that the version of record, which will have the final typesetting editing, journal branding, uh, that may be behind a, a paywall. And I, I would like to highlight that, you know, we don't see this as a sustainable business model or the end all be all to open access, but more of a, um, for lack of a better term, forcing mechanism to ensure that open access can happen and retain author choice. So, uh, you know, we've had a kind of a strict policy where some of the journals, you know, haven't been considered compliant. And so our grantees haven't been able to publish there which creates inequities around career advancement. And while we're trying to really advocate for you know, changes in, in how we uh, measure and evaluate research, it's going to take quite some time. And uh, we recognize that that puts you know, careers in a difficult spot. So we saw this as an opportunity to kind of change that and say, hey, you can you know, try to publish or submit wherever you like. Um, but we do need you to retain copyright to the author accepted manuscript. So what has our experience been for the first nine months of, of Plan S? Um, publishers have definitely reacted in, in quite a, a range from uh, being supportive of especially the rights retention strategy, uh, uh, adding their journals to transformative journal status, uh, to definitely not, uh, but that's to be expected. 
I've definitely learned that communication is key. It's very important. And with multiple stakeholders and different touch points, it can be quite difficult. We often don't know who a lot of our grantees authors are unless they reach out to us as they may be sub grantees. Um, they may be hearing different things as they're going through the publication process. Uh, so communication is, is, is definitely always a challenge. Uh, behavior change isn't easy or quick. So we're definitely you know, realizing that this is kind of a, a marathon that we're continuing on, but with, I think, um, the collective action, we can, we can actually make change, uh, it's just not gonna be overnight. Uh, the rights retention should be a larger discussion with all researchers and authors and those within scholarly communication and knowledge creation should be having. Uh, I know from a funder perspective, I would like to connect a lot more with libraries. And I think uh, together we can really help make open access a long-term reality. Uh, now is the time to leverage policy changes to take DEI into action and align values through uh, good partnerships. And I'm talking more with our program staff about uh, how you know our grantees choose to, to publish and where to publish also does uh, affect diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, and that we have a real opportunity to make sure that where our grantees publish align with our larger values as, as well. And there's strength in numbers. And so it's been a really rewarding experience to work with other open access um, experts globally. And uh, we've built, a, I think, a really good community to help us all succeed in this. Okay, and then a larger, you know, what, what about open access? Uh, you know, there's a lot of this can be up for debate and I hope we do have a great discussion. Uh, but I, I truly believe that policy does bring about behavior change. So if we're producing say guidelines or principles, those are less likely to get attention, uh, but having a policy uh, does change behavior. Our grantees are definitely paying very close attention now to policy. Uh, same with publishers that unless it's kind of an enforceable policy, um, I don't think there's a lot of drive to change there. Uh, that open access does not have to equate to expensive publishing or APCs, that does not equate to low quality research, and it doesn't mean that it's not being peer reviewed. I really hope we take the opportunity to learn from the pandemic. I'm already a bit concerned that we are kind of backsliding into old habits where um, you stuff that was openly available a year ago on the topic, already being paywalled again, uh, that we're kind of becoming less collaborative um, when we really should be you know, learning from how we worked during the pandemic um, and how that really improved things. Uh, most publishers are unlikely to give up to control and that they rely on the research community for content and able to publish. Uh, so I think especially around talking about rights retention and kind of power structures and, and um, the kind of, I think the ethos of academic publishing, I would like it to shift more towards as community support and uh, a service for the community versus giving over full rights uh, to be able to publish or holding copyright hostage for high APCs. And then the importance of partnering with publishers and vendors whose missions, values, and actions align with their own. I think that's been one of the most important lessons I've learned in the past couple of years and uh, really is trying to steer our work towards uh, partnering with, with um, projects and people whose missions align with their own is very important. Okay, and that's the end for me. My contact information is there and I look forward to uh, hearing everyone else speak and having a great discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ashley. Um, I really appreciate the presentation. I learned a lot. I know, I, you know, I know that the Gates Foundation had signed on to Plan S, um, but I think it's really amazing that, um, that the foundation isn't using the funding as sort of a cudgel and that you are you know, being sensitive to the career advancement concerns of early career researchers and things. That, that's really, um, really amazing and really um, laudatory. So thank you so much for the presentation and all the great work that you're doing. Thank you. Um, I'd like to now introduce um, Sarah Ruthie, our next speaker. In her role as the Director of Strategic Partnerships for the Open Access Publisher, Public Library of Science, Ms. Ruhi is responsible for supporting PLOS's growth strategy by identifying and developing 
new business and partnership opportunities that are currently unexplored by PLOS. As a member of the PLOS leadership team, Sarah has led the effort to build out PLOS's partnerships with institutions globally, including launching, the PLOS, including launching PLOS's first non-article processing charge-based business model, non-APC-based business models in 2020, and those are flat fees and the PLOS community action publishing. Sarah has overseen a doubling of PLOS's international customer base in less than a year, the result of extensive consultation with libraries and consortia to understand their needs and challenges during and post COVID, as well as their expectation for transparency and collaboration. Sarah is also active industry-wide as a member of the Society for Scholarly Publishing Board of Directors and consults for the Society Publishers Accelerating Open Access and Plan S project. Sarah, thank you so much for being with us and I will turn it over to you. Well, good afternoon or good morning, wherever uh, today's webinar finds you. Um, uh, thank you for that really lovely introduction. It's always really nice uh, to join um, uh, presentations like this. And of course, following Ashley is always a pleasure. Um, I'll try to tag team off of her remarks as much as I can. Uh, please feel free to throw in questions at any point um, during the, the presentation. And I know we'll have a really lively conversation at the end. Um, so my information is here. I'm going to start by blowing your minds a little bit. I don't know, maybe I will, maybe I won't. Um, but I think the, uh, the, the thing that folks can forget easily is that open access or, or not, um, the published peer review articles that you've been reading were never free, which is shocking um, in some ways. And I finally managed to embed an animated GIF into a presentation. So I feel like I have to, to show you that I was able to do that. But more importantly, um, I think it's interesting when you were, you know, whether you were reading the journal Meet Science um, as a paper object that you went into a library and uh, picked up, um, you know, say in the 70s, 80s, 90s, early 2000s, um, or you have never ever seen a uh, print copy of Meet Science and in fact only access it online, um, somebody has been paying for that. Whether uh, your access to it has been seamless thanks to IP authenticated um, access via a VPN or IP on your campus, uh, the library um, most often has been making that available to a user. And I think the the, the moment of uh, realization that that's happening for many of us is when we go off campus and log on to um, a, a journal that we've typically had access to and suddenly um, encountered a paywall. And you go, wait, what, why is there a paywall? I, I've always had access to this. You had access to it thanks to um, a, a very complicated set of agreements between libraries and publishers via technology to make that happen. And open access is really trying to um, change that paradigm and, and has in a lot of ways. So what I'm going to try to focus on today is sort of speaking to um, the perspective of a publisher that has always started with open access, but also hopefully to give authors some guidance on how to think about open access um, and APC specifically. So um, both Rachel and Ashley have, have covered this, you know, the whole point of the, the big push from the very first mandates that we saw in the early, in the early 2000s was the idea that, um, you know, for the benefit of society to get through a global pandemic, um, to deal with, you know, all of the issues that affect everyone, whether climate change or related to health, um, it, there's a moral obligation that uh, peer review research be made accessible. Um, and that is, that's the, if, if you follow any of the dial, you know, the, the debates around open access, that moral imperative is, is always very much front and center. Um, the reality is that the mass, vast majority of practitioners that um, can benefit from peer reviewed research are not individuals who conduct research themselves. So if the expectation was, you know, my child's been diagnosed with a condition, um, I want to read up as much as I can about that condition. You know, if this was pre 2000, you would ostensibly go to an academic university library, find the journal section, and have to comb through by hand to find um, articles related to your child's condition. It, it was a, it was a, a means of, of doing research or getting information that, that most of us would never engage in. It didn't make any sense. But once everything was online and, you know, there was one search box for the whole world, the idea of taking um, an issue or, or a, a subject or an idea you're trying to tackle as a person in everyday life uh, suddenly became doable that I, hey, I can, I can Google this and see what comes up um, and effectively 
educate myself. Um, my husband, for example, is a teacher. And one of the biggest frustrations he has as an expert in special um, needs teaching is so much of that research is paywalled. And, uh, you know, every time he, he finds an article he wants to dive into, he hits a paywall. And that's a very um, typical example of uh, why there's a lot of need for thinking about access in a different way. And then the last and most compelling piece, whether it's taxpayer funded or in the case of Gates Foundation, you know, founded, uh, funded through, through a, a charitable effort, um, if taxpayers are paying for research, there is a, a sort of expectation that they should be able to see what they paid for. Um, and then absolutely that authors should retain the rights that came with um, the, the work that they did. So all of this to say the whole point of, of open access in a lot of ways was for folks to be able to say, you know, I could do my own research. Unfortunately, the paradigm that we're at now, um, that's not what people mean when they say um, uh, I need to do my own research. And I was my husband sent me this this meme yesterday uh, when Facebook was down. Um, indeed, all of scientific research came to a standstill. Um, so whether or not we're going to the right places to get information, and unfortunately, the proliferation of a lot of wrong places is now a different kind of challenge. We've come a long way from the um, the days of having to find a, a paper journal uh, to find uh, peer reviewed research that you felt was trustworthy and had gone through a robust editorial process. And so the question then is, as an author or as a librarian, what is your approach to how you engage in this paradigm? Um, and you know, prior to options uh, like APCs or the option to publish open access, you paid no fee you submitted your research, you went through the peer review process, and that whole process was paid for uh, through subscriptions from libraries. And so that's where kind of the business model is changing now. So really what are APCs? Article publishing charges, um, I've heard it defined as article publishing charges, article processing charges, author publishing charges. It is the amount of money that an author is charged at acceptance um, to make a paper openly available and to retain copyright. It's one of a number of business models. The subscription business model is the one that we are all familiar with. Um, and remember, you know, that's whether your subscriptions to the New York Times, uh, so you can read their online edition, or a subscription to an academic journal. It's the same thing. It's a kind of annual recurring fee you pay to be able to read. The APC is a and is a one-time fee an author pays to be able to publish and make their work openly available to everyone else and retain their rights. So often the question is, well, what are authors paying for when they pay an APC? And this is where I think Ashley's point around the Plan S price transparency effort is really important. Um, ideally, in a perfect world, you know roughly what your APC pays for. Um, so there's a number of services that authors, uh, that publishers provide authors, readers, um, uh, and uh, anyone engaging with the digital infrastructure of, of research. Uh, authors, pro publishers provide that, there's a cost associated with it. And in a perfect world, you know, the, the APC fairly reflects that cost. The challenge is there's not a lot of transparency around what the APC pays for. Um, and I think the Plan S price transparency framework um, is one uh, pass, one, one, one attempt at addressing that in more um, detail. And I'll speak to how PLOS has engaged with that briefly. Um, and there is a rather vocal minority that likes to claim that publishers don't do anything. Um, so I, I like to gently rebut that by a, a flagging an interesting scholarly kitchen post that I think does a nice job of outlining what publishers do, but assuming that you see value in what publishers do and you wish to engage in the ecosystem, it's worth understanding what an APC is, uh, what it ensures and um, what it is not. So fundamentally it's shifting cost from the reader to the producer of the research. So where will you find APCs? Um, publishers like PLOS, when we launched from the day that we launched, everything was openly available to the public. Authors always retained their copyright and authors always paid a fee at acceptance. So native open access publishers like PLOS have always worked with this particular business model. Um, and back in the early 2000s when PLOS launched, we were, we were you know, it was just us and, and, and BMC doing that work. Now pretty much, um, every publisher offers some option uh, for open access publishing. So the hybrid option is, is, is a frequent one that many of you will encounter where you will be submitting to a subscription journal 
where you are offered the choice to pay an APC to make that closed content openly available to others. Um, in the library context, it's often referred to in some ways as double dipping because both the author is paying for an aspect of service, but then the library is also paying for um, the ability to read. Uh, then there's obviously publishers that just have both types of journals. They have journals that are APC driven, uh, fully open access, authors retain their rights from the beginning, and they have subscription journals that give you that hybrid opt-in option. And then unfortunately, there are predatory journals. Um, I'm gonna get into this in a little more depth in a couple of slides, but um, once it became clear that APCs as a business model were viable, um, there's always uh, hustlers in the, in, the, in the mix who figure out, wow, there's so much pressure to publish, we can sort of trick people into paying uh, to get their papers quote unquote published without any peer review, without um, an actual substantive journal infrastructure underpinning it, um, basically pay to play. And that's, I think that is one of those unintended consequences that really set the open access movement um, back in a lot of ways uh, in the early 2000s. We're all still recovering from the um, uh, perception in a lot of author the communities that if I have to pay a fee, it must be um, predatory. It must be poor quality, no peer review. And as Ashley said, that's not at all the case, but there is a little bit more attention that authors need to bring uh, when choosing um, which publishers and which, which journals to, to support in this way. So um, just to give examples, you know, in the case of Cell Press, which is owned by Elsevier, uh, they have open access uh, journals that are pure open access. They also have journals that are hybrid where the library pays for subscription access, but authors can also pay to make content open. Uh, American Chemical Society Publications this is a scholarly society, has the same thing. So you can see how, how those options are laid out. Um, and then of course there's native OA publishers like PLOS that um, everything is open from the jump and there are not different kinds of um, uh, ways for the author to engage around the business model. But, and I was really glad Ashley teed this up at the end of her presentation, it is absolutely worth noting that APCs are problematic on a lot of fronts. And, and I say this as a representative of PLOS for whom over 95% of our revenue comes from AP, APCs. The most important one, um, and if you care about equity, you have to care about this, is how exclusionary they are. Um, by definition, they have just shifted a paywall. The paywall is now not from reading, but for people who want to publish. And the reality is the vast majority of researchers globally cannot afford to pay even $500 for an APC, much less eight, nine, ten thousand $10,000 for an APC. Um, in many cases, it's not clear what they pay for or how they're calculated. Uh, getting back to this question of transparency, they're very expensive. You know, if an APC was 50 or 60 US dollars in some places, that would still be too high, but that's a very very different proposition from multiple thousands of dollars, which is normally where APCs are. And because they are an inherently inequitable business model, the mechanism that tries that, that tries to bring equity or bring fairness to the process is, is basically a handout. And that's that's the problem of waivers, um, which I'll I'll speak to um, momentarily as well. So Full disclosure, no secret here, PLOS was one of the first publishers to demonstrate um, that APCs were a viable business model, that there was money that authors would be willing to pay to have their work published in this way so that the reading would be completely open and unpaywalled. Um, and there were, as a result, things that we didn't anticipate. We didn't understand that by using this model, in many minds, APCs would come to be the same thing as open access. And they're not. There are many different kinds of open access. There are many different business models to facilitate open access. But unfortunately, in the kind of simple, reductive uh, way we communicate, many times these two things are equated and they're not the same thing. We didn't anticipate that predatory publishing would be something that we'd have to look out for. So we demonstrated that authors be willing to pay for a robust peer review um, experience so that readers could read at no cost. That means therefore you're gonna have um, predators coming out of the woodwork who say, great, I can use this as a way to make quick money um, and, and uh, trick folks who are less savvy in the publishing process into quote unquote publishing with um, what's essentially a, a, a false journal front. 
Um, we didn't really see the co-optation of APCs by subscription publishers coming along. Um, you know, PLOS did very well in its early years by debuting this new model and seeing a lot of revenue come in. Um, but interestingly, uh, PLOS actually suffered in the in the, the medium and long term as more and more subscription publishers uh, brought in revenue through their subscriptions from libraries, but then also charged authors to make content open access. And I don't think that was a move that PLOS or anyone at the time really anticipated would come, but has proven to be very successful. Um, and it's not surprising that efforts like Plan S have, have very deliberately said hybrid journals, journals that have a subscription revenue base and an APC uh, mechanism for open access do not count towards um, the, the the mandate that they've outlined uh, because it's it's um, it's not a sustainable uh, way of, of shifting money around in the ecosystem. And then lastly, and I mean in some ways it seems super obvious in, ref in, in, in retrospect, but we didn't really think through how APCs themselves would be a barrier to participating in publishing, which of course um, we now see that they are. So these are some of the blind spots and I think unquestioned assumptions that that come with uh, assuming that you know open access means I pay a fee and you know if I have the money that's good. Uh, that's that's not really the the case. Uh, there's there's some of the lessons learned uh, was are the ones you see here. We didn't really think about how many authors would be excluded from publishing. We didn't appreciate how much pressure there was to publish. Um, such that predatory journals could be a success. Um, and we didn't understand that there was enough money in the system whereby a publisher could make money from libraries and from authors at the same time. And I think now uh, we as a community are in the process of unpicking that. So if you had to distill all of that down um, in, into one or two key takeaways about APCs, I think the main one from the PLOS perspective we'd want to note is that as long as APCs remain the dominant open access business model, scholarly publishing, particularly in the biomedical space, will continue to be inequitable. And for PLOS, as progenitors of this model, that's not okay with us. And we're actually trying to spend a lot of time thinking through what are other models that don't rely on APCs and don't rely on waivers, what are other models that we can pursue to make publishing more equitable? And so many people ask, well, what's the problem with waivers? Uh, lots of problems with waivers. The first is that particularly for a nonprofit like PLOS, they're, they're financially unsustainable. Um, they are, PLOS is spent, I think at our, our max, we're spending $3 million a year waiving fees for researchers. And remember, researchers are unable to pay for a lot of different reasons. If you're beginning your career, you don't have a huge stable of grants funding your work, no money there. If you're located in certain parts of the globe where you know your, your exchange rates are gonna make uh, uh, APCs impossible. Um, if you work in a field where there really is no grant funding um, such that you'd be paying out of your own pocket, there's a lot of reasons um, researchers can't do APCs. The waiver process is not designed for dignity. Um, it's often messy, it's confusing, it's frustrating. Um, and at the end of the day, there's a person who has to make a call, you know, has Sarah demonstrated enough need that um, we should grant her a waiver. And fundamentally, nobody wants a handout. Any um, business model that's predicated on that kind of um, mechanism uh, isn't designed for dignity. And at least from the nonprofit perspective at PLOS, that's not good enough. And so we're actually trying to do a lot of work around looking at other kinds of models. But from the author perspective, I, the questions I think that, that every author asks needs to ask is, do I wanna publish open access? That is, do I wanna retain my rights and make my work available to anyone to read? There is a huge body of literature um, making the case that you should wanna answer yes to this question, um, if only because content that's openly available gets more eyeballs on, on it, which means it gets more attention, it gets more citations. Um, assuming you do, does the journal, journal you wanna publish in have an option? If they do, what is that option? Does it involve paying an APC? Um, because not all, open access models require that. And if they do require paying an APC, what is my option if I can't um, pay the fees? So those are the, the first place to start with questions. Um, if you're concerned about predatory publishers, uh, there's a lot of really good resources around here uh, listed on this slide that you can look to. And, and we're certainly gonna have DOAJ and um, Plan S already uh, spoken in terms of Ashley's comments. So there's a lot of 
simple, quick ways to vet if the publisher you're looking at, um, you know, is reputable and not predatory. And then, of course, there are increasingly more options for authors to publish open access with no cost to them. Um, PLOS has launched a number of efforts, but we're by no means the first. Um, there are collective action models. There are community-led models uh, driven by libraries. There are um, agreements being negotiated between libraries and uh, publishers that uh, facilitate unlimited publishing um, with, with subscription publishers. And I'm sure I missed something, so I'll, I'll leave it to my, my co-panelists and any audience members who, who um, can think of other non-APC models um, out there. The primary ones that PLOS has right now are um, these four. APCs are still our dominant revenue stream, but we are working um, overtime right now to uh, partner with libraries so that their authors can publish as much as they want with us in our different titles at no cost. And we're seeing a lot of uptake um, and interest from the library community. So I'm more than happy to um, uh, explain a bit more about these models and each of the problems they're solving. We're trying to experiment with uh, different different um, facets of, of how to think about uh, new business models. So that's what the, the models here are showing. Um, and I think I'm probably over time, so I'm going to wrap it up. Um, you can see all about our models and who participates them on our site. Uh, we try to make that as public as possible. And as I mentioned, um, we're trying to do our part around um, transparency and equity. Uh, and these are uh, just two quick resources on our site that you can uh, take a look at. And with that, I'm more than happy to uh, take questions as part of the chat at the end of the session. Thanks. Thank you so much, Sarah. You are not, um, you're not over time. You're perfectly on time. Um, and um, so I thank you for that. Um, and I thank you so much for the presentation and also for the, the humility that the that the PLOS organization is showing, it really does show that true commitment to its mission because it would be so easy to say, this is our business model, it's working for us, we have popular journals, we're making money, the rest of you guys can, can innovate and figure it out the way that we innovated and figured it out for ourselves. So it really shows institutional humility um, to, to want to do better for the community. Um, I think that's really um, a model. I hope a lot of organizations will um, we'll learn from and we'll emulate. Um, I do want to say I'm seeing some great questions in the chat and so want to um, invite everybody to continue to pose your questions for our speakers in the chat that we will be um, sharing as many as possible during the Q&A towards the end of um, this afternoon's session. Um, and with that, I'm going to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Tom Olihook. Um, Tom has been living and working in Africa for many years. He obtained his PhD in molecular microbiology from Amsterdam University, and then spent several years working at the Max Planck Institute in Berlin. Um, subsequent to that, Tom spent seven years in Kenya and Algeria, conducting research on malaria, sleep sickness, and meningococcal epidemics. Since 2012, Tom has advocated for open access and open science, as an open access working group coordinator for the open for open knowledge international in 2013 he became a member of the directory of open access journals advisory board which was instrumental in redefining the criteria for being indexed in the directory of open access <clears throat> for being indexed excuse me in the directory of open access journals since 2014 tom has served as editor in chief at the directory and for the last three and a half years, his main focus has been managing the Global Directory of Open Access Journal Ambassador Program and global outreach activities, including connecting to other open communities, such as the Creative Commons Global Network. From 2019 through 2021, the Directory of Open Access Journal's Ambassador Program has had a special focus on Africa. Beyond his work at the Directory of Open Access Journals, Tom serves as a member of the Programming Committee on Force 11, where he teaches yearly at the Force 11 Summer School on the topic of how to evaluate scientific quality for journals, authors, and individual scholars. His current research interests are copyright and licensing in open access, developing new ways to assess the quality of scholar, scholarship and scholarly works, 
and research in the area of soil microbiology as it relates to both soil health and human health. Tom, thank you so much for being with us and I will turn it over to you. Yeah, thank you so much for this uh, very uh, extensive introduction. <laughs> So this is just a title slide, but uh, I want to emphasize that this whole presentation is CCB wide, so is open access in itself. And uh, the overview of what I want to say is uh, I want to emphasize what uh, the Helsinki initiative uh, means. Then I want to tell you a bit more about the UAJ. I mean, the panelists will know it, but uh, many of the audience will probably want to be, uh, know a bit more. I will say something about the differences with other journal indexing services, also address the problem of credity publishers, and then focus on what criteria we use, especially licensing and copyright issues, and how we review journals. So one of our main aims as an indexing service is to raise the profile of open access journals in non-English speaking countries. And that is what the Helsinki Initiative means. Uh, research is international and multilingualism keeps locally relevant research alive. I think we have to realize that the publishing industry and the scientific community at the moment are really focused on Western knowledge. And there are many knowledges in the world. And all the other knowledges don't get the same chances to be disseminated by the current system not even by the open access system, because people focus on journals published by big publisher names for some reasons. So the directory of open access journals was founded by Lars Bjornshauger and other people uh, a long way back, almost 20 years. And the aim was to include all fully open access journals, not the hybrid journals, which were not known at the time, but it must be fully open access journals that have content that is 100% open access and also immediately free available online. Then we are an independent, not for profit uh, service, so we are entirely funded by donations. We have an editorial team built up in the last six years or so of 120 volunteers in all parts of the world because we want to judge journals in their own language. So for Farsi in Persia, we have a team that looks at the journals in their language and see if what they say on open access, if they publish open access. We want to promote open access journals in other languages and also promote journals in other countries that deal with other knowledge systems. All our servers are provided free of charge, and uh, I want also to say that the Plan S uh, requires the authors to publish in open access journals and Plan S, Coalition S has recognized the DOJ as the indexing service and journals need to be there, except for the a bit difficult to understand other roads like the repository road and the rights retention strategy. But those are things that are too far of my topic to go into detail and they have been explained uh, quite, quite well, I think, at the moment. Then I want to say that one of my mottos that I carry with me is that open science, why open access, why open science? Open science is just science done right. I was there when John Tennant created that, that logo, that, that slogan, and he is not with us anymore, unfortunately. But I have drawn a lot of inspiration from him. So what, what is our success? I mean, we have about 900 applications for journals to be indexed in the UAJ every month. We have an acceptance rate of 35%, but it varies per country, of course. We have a core team of 12 people paid for, and we have 120 volunteer editors who are just volunteers and not paid but we rely on those volunteers very much. We have set ourselves the goal of a three month uh, period to review applications on the average. And it has been worse. It has been between six and nine months at times. 
And uh, importantly, over 70% of our journals are without APC. That is not to say that all uh, in, in article content is 70%. But if you're searching for a journal to publish in, you are not just, uh, you, have, you don't have to go for the APC journals. Um, we also have been quite successful in covering many countries. So we have 126 countries, we have 80 languages. Uh, among those is China. And we have a special program in China to promote Chinese language journals to become open access, according to the rules that we set for open access. Because uh, the definition of open access that we have is a bit different from the definition that Chinese people would have and say open access is something free online without any reference to copyright, etc. At the moment, we have uh, 17,000 euros indexed. And as you see, I mean, the rate is 900 euros a month, 30% accepted. It, it goes up. All the major discovery services pick up the data. That means um, we have about 50,000 user sessions a day. And like Web of Science, Focus, um, EBSCO, Google Scholar, Dimensions, all have data taken from the DOJ, which are, of course, coming in free. The other indexing services, I want to compare what we do and what they do. So we have only open access journals and we have no ranking. Scopus has open access and subscription and ranking and Web of Science as well. And KBELS, uh, which is also an indexing service, has open access and subscription journals and ranking. And I focus on the ranking because that I think that at the root of the, uh, of the problem of people not being able to publish what they want, where they want, is the ranking. They think they have to publish in certain journals because the Web of Science and Scopus, which are the organizations that make the ranking, tell the authors and the funders and everyone else, this is the best journal. And so DOJ doesn't have any ranking. We don't say this is the best open access psychology journal or this is the best uh, journal in that language. We don't, don't want to go there. What we, do, what we do want is that national lists that give researchers the right to do research in certain countries accept the DOJ list as well. And we have been successful in Algeria and South Africa, and we are working on India and China. So we have no ranking. I think we have, I can say we are the most inclusive index. I will come to that uh, shortly. And uh, we say we don't have need for anything in English except for keywords. And the criteria I will talk about uh, in a moment. So comparing, and this is a bit of an old slide two years ago, but comparing DOIJ journals and Scopus and Web of Science listed journals on the open access front, so it's all open access journals, we see that we, have, we don't have some of those journals in Scopus in the Web of Science, 2,300 journals. And we have done some investigations in why we don't have them. And in uh, not uh, a few cases, we have found that the journals have disappeared or the journals don't fulfill our criteria. And we have about 8,000 journals that are not in the Scopus of Web of Science. Many of those are the journals from other regions not the West or the Northern countries, and also published in the other languages, like I said. And this proportion is, is going up. Getting to the problem of predatory publishers. So, yeah, the predatory publishing is not a problem unique to open access, because you have to know there are over 100,000 journals in the world subscription journals and about 35,000 or 40,000 perhaps of those journals are indexed in the web of science or scopus or a reputable indexing service 
So what about the other 70,000 or 60,000 euros? Uh, what are they? What is the difference between a subscription journal with a bad publishing practice, which exists, which also published research? There is no peer review for those journals. Those are also print journals. And there are links to questionable publishers. There is, uh, yeah, you can just find out that there are links. And what is the difference between those journals and an open access journal that is called predatory? I think the main thing here is that open access journals are just visible. And those 70,000 subscription journals that exist are not visible because they are behind paywalls, nobody sees them. So any bad journals in the open access camp will be visible. And it, it makes it appear as if open access has uh, predatory journals and subscription journals is all, all right, which is not true. So how can we make sure that the journals that we list are not predatory and are also of quality? Well, we have uh, simple principles, and I think I have to emphasize that we really think that every journal in the world can fulfill these criteria. We have some criteria that you need to, to, have, to fulfill, and others are optional. But if in, at any rate, all the journal content must be free, immediate open access, no embargoes. Uh, a paid for print version is, is also possible. And the journal must display, display the open access statement and adhere to our definition of open access. Open access for us means that there must be an open license and there must be copyright. And it's not just a question of gratis open access, uh, something put online without any rules. So everybody that we, all the journals that we have adhere to this definition. The journals must be active. We have any research area, any, any language, and they must publish continuously. So you cannot publish two articles in a year and then three years, nothing, and then 60 articles or so. There must be a publishing history. And new journals need to demonstrate a publishing history of one year or having published more than 10 journals, 10, 10 articles. So the website must be okay. There must be principles of transparency. Uh, they must have an ISSN for sure. We don't accept misleading metrics, all kinds of indexing uh, services that perhaps exist and give some impact factors that journals are going to, to publish with. And we don't accept pop-ups or something like that, which also some of those journals have. And we recommend a secure website. Not a, it's not necessary, but I mean, I think it prevents a lot of problems. The website should also give you the information that you need as an author and as a funder and, and also the other people. I mean, the aims and scopes should be clear. The policy should be clear. The charges should be clear and transparent. Um, especially also the editorial board should be okay. We should know who is there and we should know the, the affiliations and where they are. And there must be copyright and licensing terms. The process, um, all the journals must use peer review, editorial review sometimes. Plagiarism checking, um, we recommend because we realize we cannot check. But if we find a plagiarism issue or more than one in a journal, we will not hesitate to just remove that journal if they can't explain what happened or re retract the, the article. So it's not part of our automatic check because we cannot find out, of course, obviously looking at the journal. There are special requirements for the arts and humanities, for uh, overlay journals, for student-run journals, for flip journals and mirror journals. Uh, you can read all these things on our website, but I think we just uh, we want to monitor where the journals flipped if there is a journal that was subscription and goes to 100% open access. 
And we just recently introduced, reintroduced the open access star data again as part of our metadata so that you can see this journal is open access with a license and copyright from that date on. Uh, many parties have told us that they really are very fond of those data and it's, uh, it's useful data. And we are in the process of rebuilding that and, and getting this data in. So the, what is the importance of licensing? Well, free access is not always open access. You have to inform the readers how they can reuse. You have to inform the readers of reuse that is not allowed. And you have to protect the authors and the journal against unauthorized use. We recommend Creative Commons because it is a very good system, but we don't require it. And we also recommend that all the articles have embedded licensing and copyright information because otherwise the articles can just find their own way over the world and nobody knows where they are. But we are not going to say you need to have that. If you have it, we will know down you have it. And it's part of a scheme that we call yeah, better, better journals, better complying with open access, which, uh, yeah, which is not, not something uh, that every journal has. I think it's just a recommendation. So there shouldn't be any conflict be between licensing and copyright policies. This is often the case in, in countries, especially, and not only uh, in, in countries or like in Africa or Asia. We find it very often in the US, in journals from the US. A journal using a CC BY license, and then somewhere in their website, they also say, we grant the author the right to use the work in the personal website, university repository, blah, blah, blah. Which means this is fair use. This is also for all subscription content that, are, that authors publish. Um, certainly in the US. Uh, I, I realize fair use is different in different countries. But this is a conflict between a license and a copyright thing. So, you cannot say CCBY doesn't apply to the author. It applies to all the users, including the author. And we really do a good check of that. So for copyright, we don't accept all rights reserved. And we don't accept if authors say, yes, we share the copyright with the authors because we can better protect their, uh, yeah, their legal rights or something like that. It's a fake thing, I think. I think you, the, all the publishers need is the publishing rights or the rights for first publishing. And, and that is what we also, and what we just uh, require uh, from the journals that we index. So for example, if we see that the publisher requires an exclusive publishing right, then we say this is not full copyright retained by the author because part of their rights is just given away. And it may be that the, or that the publisher says, I want the commercial right, or they just say, we want exclusive publishing rights, which is the same thing. So this is something that we will mention in our data, metadata as not uh, having full copyright retained. Yeah, one, one important thing is that there are so many journals not uh, having any fees, no APCs. This is like uh, the diamond journals. And there are quite a few in the DOAJ, APC, non-APC. And there are quite a few from a survey and journals that are not in, in our database. I will not go into this study very much, but you can find it in this, uh, in this link. It's an interesting study to see where we are in terms of diamond uh, open access. So why should you index the journals in the DOAJ? I think you demonstrate that your journal is good. You attract more authors. Um, and you also have uh, the index included in government lists. 
So there's quite a few things that are in favor of trying to get your journal in, and we see it uh, increasing with all the publishers. Um, let me just skip that. Let me just show you how, how things come in in the DOJ. So we have a, a journal applying, and there is a new website that you may have seen. And these publishers will then have an account and they can apply for their journal and the journal will be triaged. So if we find that the journal doesn't have an ISSN, for example, or not a, a, does an accepted ISSN, a provisionary or something, then we will not uh, proceed with that application, which saves us a lot of time in the rest of the process. And there are other obvious things that we cannot accept in the in the three hours um, it then goes to DOJ editorial teams in the several countries and there are editor editors of the core team who decide on what is being done with the journal after the reviews have been done by the teams the teams say we think it can be accepted and the editor is going to check and say yes or no and if it's a no, it may be just referred back to the editorial team doing more work and giving also the publishers more chance to get in the DOJ without having to wait and do a new application. Then uh, in acceptance or, uh, or rejection, we give the feedback to the publisher and, and that's basically the scheme. So we have managed to get a system where we really can do the work in three months for every single journal. We pick out quite a few journals that uh, belong in the predatory class, but not, uh, not percentage-wise, of course, but there is quite a few journals that, that need more attention and that will be treated by a special team in the DOJ to see if they are predatory or not. And if they are predatory, they will not be accepted. So what do we really recommend as a best practice? We do recommend digital preservation, which is an ongoing project at the moment that we might uh, help publishers with that don't have money for it. We, uh, we also recommend repository policy of self-archiving. We recommend persistent identifiers. We can't require it. It's other ongoing project that we have with uh, Crosshead. And then we recommend ORCID uh, since a few months or so, like six months. And the, uh, the open standards for uh, references, for citations, which is uh, something the publishers have to fill out in the form. And mo many of them say yes but they don't know what it is. So it's, it's, it's just a new thing. But uh, it's very important for research, I think, the open citations. So we included it in our criteria and our questions. Well, that was my presentation for this moment. Um, yeah, just to emphasize the predatory issue is not something that you have to link to open access. That is my uh, final remark in this sense. Yeah, thanks, and I'm very uh, happy to answer any questions here. Uh, well, thank you so much, Tom. Um, really appreciate um, the presentation. And I think that your point is incredibly important that um, predatory publishing is not an open access um, it's not a phenomenon um, unique to open access. Um, and I think a lot of sort of open access um, assumptions um, or uh, incorrect assumptions maybe are being surfaced and challenged today. So um, thank you, Sarah, for pointing out that open access does not mean APCs. Thank you, Tom, for pointing out that predatory publishing is not a unique phenomenon to open access. I think these are really, really important points for everybody to hear. Um, I'm very excited to introduce our next speaker um, because there's been a lot of conversation and some questions in the chat about issues related to copyright and why is it important to um, maintain copyright? Why is that beneficial for scholars? So um, now I'm gonna introduce um, June M. Vesic, who is the executive director of the Kernikan Center 
for Law, Media, and the Arts, and a lecturer in law at Columbia Law School in New York City. Her research and teaching focuses on copyright and related rights, particularly concerning new technologies. She is the author of many articles and studies on copyright law. June currently serves as the chair of the American Bar Association's Intellectual Property Law Section. She is also a member of the section's Copyright Reform Task Force and is the section's liaison to the American Law Institute's Copyright Restatement Project. June is on the editorial board of the Journal of the Copyright Society of the USA and the board of advisors at the Columbia Journal of Law and the Arts. She's also a member of the board of Volunteer Lawyers for the Arts in New York. June earned her law degree from New York University School of Law and her undergraduate degree in economics from Yale University. June, thank you so much for being with us today to help us better understand the intersection of open access and copyright. I am, um, uh, I want to clear up the record, which is I'm no longer the uh, chair of the ABA section of intellectual property because it's a one year position. And last month uh, I became the immediate past chair of the um, uh, ABA's uh, intellectual property section, which I have to say, given how much work it was, it was a, a relief to change that position. Uh, and I think just like lawyers can be so much troubled. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, keep organized. It's you know herding cats kind of thing. But uh, anyway, I, I've uh, worked. I have a general you know copyright background, but I've worked with libraries in a couple of significant ways. Uh, I worked on what we called the Section 108 group, but it was put together by the uh, Copyright uh, Excuse me, the um, Copyright Office in the Library of Congress to look at the exceptions for libraries and archives under the Copyright Act and um, recommend how it should be changed in light of digital technology. And I've also been a consultant to the Library of Congress on uh, issues concerning sound recordings. I'm gonna start with a basic discussion of uh, copyright principles. Uh, anyway, so I have eight, I have, uh, I want to give you briefly uh, a summary of the copyright law and you'll know how brief it is because it is eight slides in a picture. I tried to really keep it succinct. Um, and I do apologize to those of you who have some knowledge of basic copyright, which I expect is a great many of you, but I figured that there would be at least some of you who wouldn't. And so I thought it would be useful uh, to uh, go through these points. Uh, the first point I wanted to make is that uh, copyright comes from the constitution. I mean, that's constitution authorizes copyright. Uh, to promote the progress of science by securing for limited times to authors exclusive right to their writings. Um, the reason I, I, I included this is because the basic um, a goal of copyright is uh, to give incentives to authors so that they will create works for the public benefit. And, uh, you know, it's interesting because whenever you have a case that's very controversial that finds its way to the Supreme Court, uh, you know, you'll have one side arguing, well, it's necessary to um, compensate authors and the other side's arguing what's well, necessary to create public, public benefit and, you know, skip the compensation uh, part of it. But in any case, um, science, by the way, in case you're confused, is the word used in the, uh, or a word used in the uh, 18th century for knowledge or learning. So that's why that particular word is used. Um, okay, so, uh, okay, so the first Copyright Act was passed in 1790 uh, and the protection extended to maps, charts, and books. And this is kind of tied into the incentive issue, but uh, you know, it was a young country. They wanted to know the, you know, meets and bounds uh, find out where, uh, you know, their acquisitions, you know, occurred and where they had to watch their borders. And so that's for maps and charts and books. It was interesting, but of course it seems logical, copyright books, but they had a specific goal of trying to foster a, um, a domestic uh, based uh, creativity. They wanted to have things that came from our country so that we weren't relying always on the cultural contributions of other countries. Okay, um, why don't you go to the next slide. So this is the subject matter of copyright. And um, all right, so copyright protection subsists in original works of authorship fixed in any tangible medium. 
Uh, and uh, that actually comes from an old case where somebody took a, uh, a, a song and they put it on a piano roll and the court case went up to the Supreme Court for infringement by, by the piano roll. And the you know justices looked at it and saw this paper with little holes in it and said, doesn't look like a copy to me, you know? <laughs> you can't know what the song sounds like by seeing this piano roll. So that's why you see how careful the tangible medium of expression now known or later developed from which they can be perceived with the aid of a machine or device. Just because you can't see it with your bare eyes, it still is protected by copyright. And then there's exclusion for copyright, uh, which is ideas, procedures, processes, systems, methods of operation, and so on. Um, so they don't want copyright to have a monopoly over concepts. Uh, in also, I didn't put this on the slides, but if you're uh, curious, uh, copyright.gov is the Copyright Office website. They have a lot of stuff geared toward people who aren't copyright lawyers, and I definitely recommend it. Um, okay, so let me just move on to the subject matter of copyright having to do with what categories of works. And uh, you've got them all for you. I won't read them all except to just make a couple of observations. And that is that, well, as you could tell by maps, charts, and books, the first copyright had protected a very limited amount of things. And over time, these different uh, categories of works came in, you know, musical works uh, and uh, dramatic works and that kind of thing. Uh, the most recent were architectural works, motion pictures, pantomimes, uh, you know, those are relatively recent. Uh, by the way, this is a not an um, uh, exhaustive list. It's still possible to have another uh, category, um, but so far they've been rejected. I mean, just to give you an example, you know, uh, fireworks can't be <laughs> copyrighted. All right, so let's go on to the next uh, slide. And that is um, one, yeah, one uh, requirement of copyright is that it requires a human author. Now, uh, some of you may have met Naruto. This is Naruto. And um, a uh, photographer uh, offered Naruto's photo and said Naruto had actually taken the photo. Now, I'm sure he said that because it brought more attention to the photo. Unfortunately, it also lost copyright for the photo because uh, having said that it was created by uh, the monkey, um, it became no longer eligible for copyright. Uh, ironically, this case uh, was challenged and um, uh, Neruto ultimately lost, uh, but uh, in the meantime, you know, there was somebody who wanted, who wanted to be Neruto's guardian ad litem because he couldn't, you know, litigate the work on his own. Uh, PETA came in and to protect, you know, Neruto's rights and so on, but eventually, uh, the, um, the principle remained and you need a human author. Now, obviously cases aren't usually as clear cut as this one, um, but the, oh, an area it comes up in and will continue to come up with, come up in a, um, for a long time is uh, it, it, artificial intelligence. Because uh, right now it's generally understood that a computer program can't uh, create a copyrightable work. But that is a very complicated issue and um, we're not done with that in terms of uh, uh, how it will be ultimately resolved. Okay, now I'm moving to some of the things that are, I think, very relevant uh, for what we're doing. What is ownership of copyright? So copyright vests initially in the human author or authors if there's more than one of a work. Um, and uh, the author is the human creator, as we mentioned, except in the case of something called a work made for hire. And we'll go on to the work made for hire issue. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Okay, so um, there are two ways a work can be a work made for hire. One is if it's a work prepared by an employee in the scope of his or her employment. So if you are the, you know, janitor for the building that you work in, if you write poetry, you know, that's not going to be uh, something that your uh, employee, employer is going to own. Um, sometimes though, I mean, that's obviously a very stark example, but uh, there are a lot of cases where it's very difficult to differentiate between what's part of the job and what's not. 
Okay, the other type of work for hire is one prepared by an outside contractor, but both parties have to agree in writing. They both have to sign it that it'll be a work made for hire and it can only fall within one of these nine categories of works, which I won't uh, bother to read. But as a practicing lawyer, when people come in and say, um, isn't this a work made for hire? Uh, they, I don't employ them, but I hired them to do this for me. Don't I own it? And the first question you always look at is, was there a writing? Because almost always there's not a writing. And so you can dispose of the issue very quickly. Um, okay, so one thing that is really interesting is uh, what is the status of faculty articles? Are journal articles um, written in the scope of their employment or is it outside the scope? Um, there have been a few cases on this issue, less than you would think. Uh, and I would say the law on it is not clear. Uh, and also, uh, you have to remember, <laughs> and this doesn't change the law, but it makes one rather cynical. Uh, most of the judges who decide these cases uh, <coughs> um, uh, went to law school and did journal articles before they became judges. So, you know, they can't help but look at them fondly. Uh, all right, so um, why, there's not a lot of low law. Why do we treat uh, the articles as uh, faculty um, owned as we do? And that is, I think, because of um, it, policies and practices in uh, universities. Uh, and this is the way it's been done. And uh, you don't wanna alienate your faculty by making a major change. Um, this came to a head or when um, a head when uh, some professors started to do online courses and um, obviously they got paid for them. That wasn't something their employer um, got uh, paid for. And that was worked out through agreements, you know, policies uh, and, um, you know, it varies from university to university, although I'm sure there are major uh, similarities. Okay, term of protection of copyright uh, is um, life of the author plus 70 years. If it's work made for hire, it's 95 years from publication or 120 years from creation. I will just observe that, I, but I'm sure you're all thinking that's a very long time. Okay, uh, copyrights, what they call the bundle of rights. It's not a single right. The one people most readily think about that's the most central right is of course the reproduction right. Um, and then there's a creation of derivative works uh, that may be an updating of a uh, textbook or a movie from a book. Uh, and then there's um, public distribution, public performance and public display. Um, but you know, these rights have different uh, relevance to uh, different types of works. Uh, for example, there are some works for which there's no right of public performance because you don't perform the work. Um, but so retaining the copyright has more significance in some cases. Okay, transfer of rights. Uh, rights can be transferred separately or together. Now, what I think that, uh, you know, a lot of the uh, people who spoke today are really um, emphasizing that the efforts being made to uh, transfer some rights, but for the, uh, you know, the author to uh, maintain certain rights as well. Um, if you want to assign rights, you have to get assigned writing. And I think probably all these journals do that. Uh, Non-exclusive licenses don't require a writing. So when you get permissions and things like that, you don't need a writing. However, um, you know, you always have to think as a lawyer of what could happen. And what could happen is uh, you want to do something different. And the party that you got the permission from says, I didn't agree to that. So, uh, you know, it, it's always better to get it in writing. And then uh, joint authors can individually grant a license, but uh, they um, have to share the proceedings from their, uh, with their joint author. Uh, so one person can, you know, one of the joint authors can grant a license, but can't benefit from that license necessarily. That's different in other countries. They often uh, require that everybody together uh, do you grant whatever license there is. All right, I'm gonna spend just one quick slide on copyright exceptions. And the you know only reason I put them in is because, I mean, you know, sometimes when you hear copyright, it seems so sweeping. And actually there are lots of exceptions. 
Uh, and I'll just give you an example, there are exceptions for libraries and archives, for people with disabilities, for in-person and distance learning, uh, for first sale doctrine, and I'm sure everybody's heard of fair use. Uh, the first sale doctrine just means if you sell somebody a copy of the book, you have no control over that copy. You can't say, well, you can't turn that over to person such or whatever. Uh, I won't even begin to talk about fair use because that could be a day's you know, study. All right, so um, let's turn to my observations about open access. And remember, you know, fundamentally, I am a lawyer not immersed in this area. Uh, but uh, it seems to me that uh, how open the access is varies in the permitted scope of the use. Uh, but it, it doesn't seem like any of these uh, open access resources are striving to put the work in the public domain basically by uh, requiring the author to assign all rights in perpetuity. Um, but, uh, you know, so, so while you can put your work in the public domain, that's not something that's essential to an open access resource. Uh, now, in my view, because this is something that's really taken off in the years that I've been practicing, uh, I think it, and you've heard people more authoritative than I, but it seems like the increased price of journals um, the conviction that it's unfair to authors that they should do all the work and the publisher should own the product. And then I think there's also the technological capability to assemble and manage and to archive a large database. I mean, you know, this is just not something that would have been meaningful, uh, you know, back in the 1980s, let's say. Uh, so what about archiving? That's something that, uh, um, you know, it would be good if uh, open access sources could do that. And I think the larger ones most certainly do. I mean, I'm sure PubMed does that. Um, and, and a lot of very well-respected ones, but I'm sure that there are other uh, uh, open access repositories that don't do that kind of archiving because um, as I expect most of you know, archiving is not just, uh, you know, you, you know, press control copy or something like that. It's, um, it's a, an important process to archive because uh, you have to have your um, archive in a form that you can uh, convert it to a new um, uh, computer language, you know, whatever, to make sure it's still workable, usable. All right, let's see. Okay, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the continuing role of publishers. You know, publishers, at least what I know, and, I, and obviously, you know, some of you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I thought their uh, contribution was um, supervising peer review, which I admit they can't, they don't have that entirely, um, they don't have monopoly on that. Uh, curating, editing, and goodwill. In other words, um, I think it's still the case that the uh, journal in which you publish does matter. I think that's changing, but it hasn't changed yet. And, you know, if you're in a particular field, it's better to be in journal A than journal B. And especially if you're as yet untenured, that matters. Um, so other things about the publishers. If open access to materials is broadly or completely available, it will drive publishers out of the market. Um, I guess my question after listening to everybody today is, do we care? Um, and I don't know what the answer to that is. Uh, now, so far the market's accommodated coexistence of publishers and open access resources with that APC, that article processing fee, uh, and the delay in making works available through open access. Now I uh, heard um, some uh, unhappiness with the idea of delay and people thinking that it should become immediately available. Uh, I know that PubMed Central is gives in a year grace period. And that was a subject of negotiation because publishers and authors had a problem with that. Um, just to give you a num another example, which isn't precisely open access, but I think it's still relevant and that's JSTOR. Uh, JSTOR is done by agreement, but lots of, you know, like universities and lots of um, uh, uh, libraries and other similar institutions um, and publishers are all involved in this agreement. It's widely available. 
Uh, I have to tell you when I was working on something and I mentioned JSTOR, my then college age daughter was extremely impressed. So <laughs> I guess there's something, um, but in any case, so uh, JSTOR uh, requires uh, a deposit of all the journal articles um, within a certain time, but it agrees not to put them up on its site for three years. They're very reluctant to agree to three years, but um, if they have to, to get the stuff, they will do that. Um, and JSTOR serves an incredibly useful purpose, which is it is an archive of all those materials. And you know the situation with um, having an archive of these works was amazing. But when they went to try to start this uh, database, this open access database, they um, uh, couldn't, even the publisher couldn't give them copies of the works. So, you know, uh, it just showed you how much something like this was really needed. So, you know, that, that uh, you know, if you have somebody who's compelled to be part of uh, an open access uh, um, facility, then uh, this isn't as important, but when you want people to volunteer, then I think you have to provide them with something that will uh, give them an incentive to be part of it or at least make the, uh, the uh, consequences for them not be, not be unfortunate. Okay. Um, okay, Creative Commons. I was asked about Creative Commons and what that does. So Creative Commons was a nonprofit organization that was created in 2001. And its goal was to broaden the access uh, to um, creative works and allow them to be used legally. Their website is www.cc.org. I know a lot of you are uh, familiar with uh, Creative Commons because uh, that's one of the places where um, it's considered an acceptable uh, repository, if you will. Um, now, Creative Commons provides a choice of licenses under which you can make the work available. And each of these uh, licenses is uh, indicated by a particular uh, symbol. Um, so for instance, uh, you can say, uh, well, all of the license, by the way, uh, allows you to, um, you know, to read the thing and, uh, you know, generally people to access it, but you might want to put your work, uh, in Creative Commons and not allow commercial use of it, or you, uh, might want to say, uh, okay, it can go in Creative Commons, but you can't make derivative works and the symbol on the work, uh, indicates what those limitations are. Now, I think uh, attribution was always one of the you know, options, but I think that was so frequently used, it was rolled into the basic license. Uh, I have to say, it's interesting. I think it's great that you know, attribution is part of all these um, agreements. Ironically, the Copyright Act has no attribution requirement in it, which I think is ridiculous, but that's the way it is. Okay, so just in winding up, why put something on open access? Well, it could be mandatory. Um, it, uh, you know, that could mandate could come from the government, from the funder, we've heard a lot about that, from your university. Uh, universities have their own uh, uh, archives and they have their own strategies for getting the works put on this repository. Uh, I, I remember reading that when Harvard started this, you, um, were required to put your articles in their uh, open access repository, but you could get an exception if you went to, I don't know, whoever it was, the Dean or something, and you'd have to get a special exception to actually um, keep it off that repository. Now, um, I don't think necessarily that that's, ne that, that uh, I think a lot of contracts for open access still allow you to keep it on your own, um, um, June, I'm just going to, I'm sorry to, to jump in and stop you. I do think that talking about um, um, putting something on open access, we may be preaching to the choir. <laughs> we may be preaching to the choir a little bit here, and we do have just 15 minutes left. So I do want to um, make sure that we have an opportunity to um, have some questions because we have had so many great questions from our audience. So I'm so sorry to um, to stop you um, there. Um, but I do want to thank you so much. I do think that there is not a... Um, really robust understanding of copyright among many um, really smart people, faculty, um, librarians, um, 
and all up and down the spectrum. So I think it's so, so important, the foundation that you laid for us and talking about the importance of what copyright covers, what it doesn't cover. Um, and so I wanna thank you so much. And I wanna also take this opportunity to rethink all of our speakers this afternoon. Um, and again, I do wanna now turn to some of the questions that we've received through, um, through the, the Q&A and through the chat. Um, one question that um, I have received personally um, from many of the users in the Mount Sinai user community, and I see it reflected as well in the chat and the Q&A, um, is, you know, the, the question boils down to, you know, it seems like we as authors get caught in the middle between publishers and institutions being charged high fees and open access fees paid by authors. So where is the solution for that non-grant funded author? Um, and I know that, you um, each of you have spoken to this a little bit, but Sarah, I'd love to um, tee you off with this one because I know that PLOS has a lot of initiatives on this front. Sure. Um, so definitely from the PLOS perspective, we take the view that come, come to PLOS, submit. If you don't have the funding, apply for a waiver. Don't let the APC be the reason that you don't submit. There's plenty of other valid reasons not to, but if your concern is I can't, I can't pay the fee, um, that we have a couple when, when you get to our site, we give you some instructions on how to um, check. Maybe your institution already has an agreement with us. If they don't apply for a waiver, again, fully acknowledging that waivers are not the the, the most equitable way to address the issue, but it's the interim solution we have right now. The other piece we're encouraging um, authors to do is if you know we would like to publish with PLOS in the future to reach out to us via your library so we can see if there's some kind of partnership that we can set up with your library where you don't have any fees to publish um, either in all of the titles or specific titles. And that really holds true for most publishers. Um, they often have waiver programs around APCs. And increasingly, as um, Tom mentioned and, and Ashley noted, there are plenty of journals out there that don't charge APCs at all for open access publishing. There's just a little more work on your part as an author to do the homework and the research to make sure it's the right scope, it's the right audience uh, for, your, for, for your work. Um, and I invite anybody else. Yeah, I'll, I'll add a, a quick couple things. Uh, first is I, I wouldn't um, understate the importance of the green open access route. So definitely check before you submit and see kind of what are the you know self archiving um, options. Of course, I you know I also kind of want to tie in that importance of keeping your copyright. So that was a hope I'm not jumping the gun there, but I think it's all really tied together because I, I do think that. What I'm seeing now in this kind of business model marketplace is really, it's the kind of the copy, right? Yes, access as well, but really the copyright to your work. So um, a lot of these copyright transfer agreements are becoming very restrictive. Like you can't share it on your personal website. You can't share it to, you know, like ResearchGate or other social kind of social academic sites like that. Um, or you can share it, you know, and they're on your personal site, but like nowhere else because they're like, maybe you, they won't really find it. And so there's a lot of kind of um, nuanced stipulations there that you want to be aware of. But if you can find a journal that maybe Yes, you can't afford the APC to make the version of record open access that you can make a version of it open access. And again, I encourage people, I know it's it's not fun and can also be scary and it depends where you are in kind of the authorship list, but uh, you can push back and, and say, hey, want to publish your great it's accepted but like we're crossing out this line as far as like oh you won't let me you know share it with with other you know faculty staff or educate you know um you can you can try to set those agreements and push back because they're always going to try and and get as much of that as they can if this is a traditional uh subscription journal because when they retain when they take your your rights and hold the the exclusive copyright uh, they then control moving forward, you know, if, if somebody wants to use a table or a figure uh, from that paper that usually that, that costs then the other authors. And so that's one of the main reasons that we really want to make sure things are openly licensed and that copyright remains with the authors is that that reuse and that ability to have kind of further impact without any financial or um, legal constraint there, because there's no reason that really, from my point of view and and definitely very happy to be convinced otherwise that that 
that publishers should have that kind of overreach into the research ecosystem instead of being a service provider and providing services to the community around knowledge dissemination. Can I say something here? I think that also the uh, one, re one means to go to lower rates can be local publishing and society publishing again. I don't say that the, the publishers have to just go out of their business, but there must be, uh, there is so much knowledge that we have to publish on and that is not being published because of the ranking that I explained and, and the whole system. So that if you go to local publishing that is accepted by the local government as being genuine research and also the topics that are researched in those countries are relevant for those populations and not relevant uh, medical research being done in, in some country in Africa, which is only relevant for Canada because the problem, the medical problem is not there in Africa, but it's in Canada, you know, look, for example, diabetes or something. It's not a, not something somebody in Uganda should research on, except for when he wants to publish in a medical journal in the north. And that is the, that is a false drive, I think. We should promote local publishing, low cost publishing, and uh, possibly in some some countries like Japan, society publishing more than we do at the moment. Thank you all for your um, your feedback on that. I want to stay on this theme for a minute, um, which I would consider that sort of rock and hard place um, in the same way that I know authors feel that crunch, especially our early career faculty, our trainees feel that crunch. Um, and I think you all have raised a lot of great points about options that are out there, diamond open access journals and um, the self archiving and other options. Ashley's point about pushing back on, on licensing restrictions or copyright restrictions is, is a really good one that I think anybody can take and use, hopefully for most or all journals. Um, I would say for, we have a lot of librarians in the audience today and we also feel ourselves in a rock and a hard place. I can say that um, at, at our library, um, we frequently get questions, can you help me pay or defray or pay part of the cost of open access um, publishing fee um, where you know we're still in that place where we need to maintain all these subscriptions. Um, one of our, our attendees said it better than I do. She says, I find it frustrating that the cost of APCs and read and publish agreements are often getting pushed back to libraries to support. So it's an additional cost on top of the unsustainable subscription costs. So. Um, it's not just a problem for libraries, of course, it's a problem for faculty and all of our users who use libraries. So I'd love to hear your thoughts about that, about how the kind of cost center keeps coming back to the library. I can jump in on that. I, I, I've spent um, a good two years, you know, talking to libraries and consortia about precisely uh, this question, because when PLOS started exploring models in this space, the first question we had to consider was, do libraries even want to have a conversation with us? I mean, in most cases, we are asking libraries to support something they have never spent money on before. Authors have paid, so it's a different funding stream entirely. Um, and one of the things we were overwhelmed with um, in 2019 and 2020 was how many libraries said, we absolutely want to be engaging in this way, but we are in this weird bardo where most of the money is locked up in subscriptions. We're starting to engage in agreements, read and publish agreements to shift um, or flip our subscriptions. Um, and so we're, we're, we're in that middle space that hopefully will start to ease up as more content becomes open and more uh, content is accessible via these agreements. But that said, Libraries have made really, really hard decisions and said, you know, we know for a fact we want to support PLOS or Open Library of the Humanities or Direct to Open or any of these models. And so we have decided we're canceling these other things or sorry, PLOS, we're not ready to talk to you yet. We're in the process of a big cancellation with a big, bad top five commercial. We will be in touch when that happens. Um, and other other 
you know, activist libraries, the MITs of the world, the UCs of the world, you know, folks say, well, that's nice for them. They, they have the, the power and influence to do this. But I've been amazed that, you know, smaller libraries, smaller state schools have found ways to support um, even just our collective action model, because they've said, you know, this is something that matters to us because it's community led and it's, it's community driven. So I think a lot of it is libraries having internal conversations about, you know, what are our priorities and it's it feels like a spectrum you know some libraries are really thinking very very transactionally you know how do we save money that's that's our focus and that totally makes sense others are massively activist like MIT and the UCs but most of us fall in the middle right there's a there's a pragmatic balance we're trying to strike here and a, a place that I think a lot of libraries could find useful in starting is looking at the negotiation principles that um, a number of libraries and library organizations have put together because they have a nice way of acting as a filter for an institution to think about, okay, if we wanna prioritize these agreements, any publisher who won't abide by these, these principles automatically goes lower on the list, right? It gives you um, an objective framework with which to think about, well, where do we start? Because it feels like such a big thing to bite into. Um, so I'll share in the um, the chat a couple of the MIT publisher negotiating framework that put us through our paces and we came out the other end with a better offering thanks to MIT really sticking to that. Um, there's a number of other ones I'll throw in there, but I, I encourage, there's a kind of um, real conversation that has to be had internally amongst librarians at their own organizations about where they wanna prioritize. I would just say about that, that sometimes I feel like librarians maybe are a little on the avant-garde and maybe ahead of where our institutional mandates, um, you know, um, but that doesn't mean that we need to just say, okay, and, and, you know, dust off our hands and call it a day. It's what can we really do to be advancing this conversation because it's good for science. Yes, and, and two things that I would add, I think, yeah, definitely I'm seeing a shift of academic libraries uh, negotiating by values, which I think is, is very important. I think we've, librarians also have been very good at making this all look very easy and straightforward throughout everything that we do. So faculty can get very used to you know, easy access without thinking about all the complicated negotiations, contracts, pricing, and costs that goes on. Like, Sarah, I love your somebody pays and thank, hashtag thank a librarian. It's so spot on. And so I think we're going to have to get outside of a comfort zone of constantly um, always, you know, being able to make things happen for faculty demands without having kind of the tough conversations of like, this is why we have to cancel this journal um, because it's just, yeah, not, a, not affordable anymore or, or other reasons. And, uh, and I think the other thing is, is we've also been very good at always, yeah, hiding that, that cost. And that's one thing that I have to say, I really appreciate about APCs is now I'm getting authors messaging me and being like, I'm not gonna pay five thousand dollars for this. What is this? And and I, and you know that I I I get that. And it, it is you know so it's it's that price transparency I think is going to be a very important development over the next few years when we have conversations um, around this because it you know really cost is the the core of it and library budgets can't sustain it anymore. I've heard. Um, you know, librarians that don't necessarily want to use their budgets to help support the activities of societies, which I think is a very valid and interesting argument uh, and topic to to discuss. And so that's, I think we have to be uh, more proactive about having these tough conversations around uh, price and, and prestige and, and what it means for tenure and, and all of that is is tied into it. Um, well, the time has slipped away from us. We do have so many wonderful questions, um, and I will um, ask our speakers, um, you know, let you know, I'd love to follow up with you guys with some of the questions um, after the event, and I know we've had a couple of requests to um, have copies of your slides, so um, I hope that we will be able to, to share those. Um, I want to take the opportunity one more time to thank um, each and every one of you to thank all of our speakers um, and certainly to thank the event team at Levy Library. That's Carrie McKee and Angela Thornton at um, the Mount Sinai AV team media services. That's um, Fausto, Jerry and Shalicia who's here with us today. So thank you all so very much. Um, I heard a quote um, from 
Simone Weil, who said that um, attention is the rarest and purest form of generosity. So in addition to everybody I've mentioned so far, I'd like to thank all of you who have joined us this afternoon for your attendance and your attention. Um, and that about wraps it up. Thank you all for attending. Our recording of the session will be available on the Levy Library YouTube channel. And I invite everybody to um, follow us on all of our social media channels to stay up to date with future events at Levy Library. Thanks, everyone, and have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.